Okay, let's get going. Um, as Jeff mentioned, I'm editor of Flute Talk magazine, and it surprised me once I became editor what the most requested item was from all of the previous issues of Flute Talk, and it was the 1988 article by Frances Lapp Averett, where she reports on uh, Michelle Debeau's scale game, and she publishes um, his 60 ways of playing scales. Many of you may have downloaded that or, or copied it out of the magazine at the time. And um, I was one of those ones who, who did it too. I looked at his scale game and I thought, this is genius. However, it's way too hard for my students. And by way too hard, I meant it had the kind of things in it maybe students wouldn't have the patience to do, like playing scales at 40 to the eighth note on the metronome. You know, I can tell you my, my students like probably like yours are very action oriented. They like to play rhythms. They like to play fast. They like to tongue. They like to do things. So, so I just kind of took his idea and wrote my own scale game. Um, within the next few years, he began coming out to Idaho with me and teaching my Pocatello flute week. And so the first time he came, I said, well, at 10 o'clock, you're going to lead a scale game. And, you know, I wrote one because yours is, is wonderful for the professional player, but for the student, it's, it's a little too hard. Oh, he was thrilled. He said, oh, I can't believe somebody's doing something with this. And so then I said, oh, and also too, you know, here in Idaho, we all play together. We don't just have one person play and then the next person play on a different key and go around the room that way. We all play together. And he said, you can do that. I said, oh yeah, it works great. After he came out from teaching the class, he said, I'll never do it the old way uh, again. I'll, everybody will always play. Well, time went on. Michelle kept coming back in the summers to teach. And um, I, I noticed that some of my students moved a certain way when they played certain rhythms or certain patterns and some of the other ones didn't. And the ones who seemed to move in the same way that I did or the Michelle did, um, were, general, were the more musical ones. And so I set about trying to figure out what, what was on the page that made them move a certain way. And um, uh, it took me a while to figure this out, but um, I, I, I think I have, and I wanna share that with you first before we start and then the scale game will make a lot more sense. In music, we have two gestures. Either we come away from the beat or we lead to the beat. And I know on the, on the East Coast there, there's probably more students that are descendants of William Kincaid than there are in the rest of the country or where I live. Um, but I was fortunate enough to study with him. And, and you may recall, he taught a note grouping pattern where you played your scales one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. Two, three, four, one. And then faster where it's one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, that forward flow idea. I was never really comfortable with that um, when I was studying with him. And one day I just said, you know, I'm playing this Mozart concerto and I just don't feel like that some of these runs should be one, two, three, four, one, two. Three. I feel like they should just kind of go. And he said, you think about it. I did think about it. And luckily for me or unluckily for me, um, I toyed with the idea of, of doing a music education major at Eastman rather than the performance major. And I, I had to take a year of violin. And that year of violin was probably one of the, the courses that I use the most because I learned so much about bowing. And um, the Kincaid one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one is really an up bow idea because in violin playing, kind of the very basic bowing, if the idea starts on the beat, the idea is as a down and up idea, which would be down bow, up bow. If the idea starts off the beat, it's an up bow idea. And I realized, you know, Kincaid had had half the story just great, but there's a whole nother story out there. And now we know through the study of early music that that idea of coming away from the beat of the down up idea was very prominent because the mu early music is about dancing where the romantic music is all about singing and going to one leading to one. So the two gestures that we use, the first is down up. And this one Kincaid taught, but only for doing two note slurs. 
down, up, down, up, down. And I'm not moving, when I do this, I'm not moving anything on my chin. It's the same gesture that I would use when I'm cueing somebody to play and I go, I just take a breath and lift. That's all it is. It's not, the flute's not wiggling like this on your, on your chin. The other gesture forward flow is actually the flute is stationary, but you're, if you're standing, you're shifting your weight from the right back foot to the front left foot. So it's this feeling going forward. If I'm sitting in a chair now, so I'm rocking from my right back sits bone to my left sits bone. And if you're sitting in a chair, you should be, your body should be 45 degrees to the right when you're playing um, with a screen. Okay, well, we're going to, um, work on these two gestures and the way they're they're notated in the flute scale book is the down bow you actually uses the down bow idea from um uh, violin bowing and then we use the up bow but you know with up bow for us as flute players we can go up bow forward or up bow back and if you'll notice about a third of the way down this page it says there's a down bow sign move the flute down up up bow forward move the flute forward shift the weight forward, up bow back, shift the weight back. And um, I like to play these scales with bowings because I think it helps um, put the phrasing gesture in my head more, um, just, just where it's better. Now, in the practice room or in the studio, I encourage the students to move a lot. And it's kind of the old karate kid idea. You remember where he washed the car on and he polished it off and everything. He did it thousands of times until it became a natural movement for him. And that's what we want. We want to have that feeling of the, that we're really directing the line. So we're gonna overdo it in the studio. But when I'm on stage, if I'm doing a forward flow, it may be as small as that. You probably wouldn't even notice that it's being done. You know, uh, the down and up, we may use more, especially if we're cueing and we want to cue a retard or we want to speed up or something, or we want to do a, some kind of cutoff, you know. Okay, now um, the scale again that I'm using is based on the tone color scales from our flute scale book. Um, and I call, I changed the name, I guess in the Toffanel number four, there was no name at all, but I, I just named this exercise tone color scales because I don't, I think people do this exercise, but they don't realize what the end goal is. And the end goal is to get a homogeneous sound throughout the range. And, you know, by going F to F and then it's just one note up and G to G. Can you make that sound the same as F to F? And you work your way up and you work your way down. So just with, with these one octave uh, scales, you're really working on having the same tone color uh, throughout the range. And, and, and by tone color, we mean timbre. Um, I, I went to Home Depot and I looked at the paint chips on the wall and I picked out a whole bunch of them in a blue and a whole bunch in a green and a whole bunch in a kind of a red and a purple. And so I have these and so we look at them, you know, in the studio and say, look, this is still blue, but they're going to be blue with less core and blue with more core. And that's the kind of thing here. We're trying to get control over the tone color so that um, we don't sound like that we're playing blue, 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 orange, blue, 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 red, you know, so that there's a, so the color changes. Okay, so our goals in doing this, so number one is the phrasing gestures. The number two is to, um, take those phrasing gestures and have intelligent movement. Too many flutists never think about what happens on the end of their flute. And they have a tremendous amount of tension on the end of the flute because it's going all the time in just a really weird direction. We're trying to get this, this where it's much more relaxed and flowing with the end of the flute. And that's why we call this intelligent movement. We're also looking for a homogeneous sound throughout. And, um, we're also working to keep the fingers very close to the keys. And something you may not have thought about, but I really like to think about the key, my, the tip of my finger, the, the little pad here, hitting in the same place on the key every time I play so that I'm always touching in the same place because I think that's where you get really the beautiful control of the legato. Um, 
the uh, the last thing that I I I, I think uh, there's many things you can think about. The other thing I just want to mention is Kincaid talked a lot about this being a fingerboard, and I think we don't think about this enough. But if you're trying to to build your technique, this is something that you really this is the key in. So when you start on low D, you're here, and you go all the way up, um, say to C sharp, which is there. The next note after C sharp is D, which is all the way back down here every time you're playing and you have to go all the way back to the end of the flute that's where you have to be cautious that's where you have to wait just a nanosecond so that all your fingers are down and everything and it, you kind of play out of time to be in time so let's just take that f major scale so we're starting here f g a now when i go to the b flat i'm really going back toward the foot joint of the instrument again. C, I'm good. <coughs> now from C to D, do you see I have to go all the way back to the foot joint so that C to D takes a little bit more time than going from D to E or E to F. And so I don't know if you've ever played <coughs> a show, a Broadway show, but when you get the books, you'll see that before certain passages, there'll just be a slash before a note. And that's what somebody has written in there to show you that. Just this, and it's interesting, just when you, your eye sees that slash, that just it's enough moment, mo, just a, enough time to slow you down so you finger correctly. And um, you may not have ever thought, well, how did they decide where to put that slash? You know, but it has to do with where you are on the flute. So thinking this is a fingerboard, just like a violinist would, where all the notes are is very, very good. Okay. Um, so we're going to start with um, F major. And um, I, I just like to mention one thing. Um, I was talking with Trevor Y about TNG number four, and it always bothered me that in the minor sec, the minor scales, they weren't consistent throughout the whole exercise. I think there's four or five places that you have to go in and fix the accidentals for students. Um, and I was talking about him. He said, well, you realize that that exercise came from somebody else from an earlier time. That was not original with Toffinell or Gobert. And I said, no, I didn't realize that. And, and he, he said, yeah, it's an early treatise. And I said, well, which one? And he said, I don't know. I can't remember. He said, if it shows up here, I'll let you know. Well, in writing one of our books, I was going through IMSLP with a fine tooth comb and I found it. And it's in the POP, P-O-P-P, -P -P, uh, Flute School, School, Volume 2. And in that, the melodic minor, the minor scales are always written in the melodic minor form. And so in talking with that, with, with Trevor, uh, he said that he had decided that he was going to have his students play the minor section all in pure form, then in harmonic form and melodic form. I don't have the luxury of having that much time with my students. And so I made the decision of kind of what many of the violin professors have done at universities, melodic minor scales is the, we're going, the way we're going. And so in our scale book, they're written out in the melodic minor form. And so that's something you might want to consider when you're doing your scale game about maybe not playing the minor scales in such a mixture. Um, so anyway, okay, we're going to start first. So get your flute and be sure it's line, aligned well. However you align it, it's a personal decision. It's just the main thing you should align the same way every day. Okay, so we're going to start with the phrasing gestures and we're going to work in chunks. And a chunk is a group of notes, usually an inch long, and then you take a rest. And during the rest, you take a sip breath. A sip breath is just a, some people call them guppy breaths, you know, but whatever it is, it's just a topping it off kind of breath. And we're gonna slur by fours and we're gonna go from down to up, okay?
Now we're going to start right there because I we, we have a lot to do and I, we don't have a lot of time. Now we're going to go to number two, which is down and up by eight. Now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then you bring it back down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we call that retaking your bow. That's what you're going to So you're going back to the, the spot. One of the problems that we have on the flute is when the notes go up, we like to lift the end of the flute. When the notes go down, we like to go th this way with the flute. To play the flute well, the flute should be balanced in the hand and stable. It should not move at all. The only thing that moves are your fingers. And so if you notice that when you're playing da -da -da -da, and your flute's sagging, that's tension that you don't want. Okay, now we're going to do down and up by eights, starting again on the first line. Retake your bow. Okay, number three, we're going to do it by 16. So that's a whole measure. So start back on measure one again. keep building on that idea um, of doing two measures, four measures, and ultimately what you want to be able to do is all eight measures as the flute is coming up, which leads to me one, to one of my favorite sayings of all times. If you really want to improve your technique, and we're talking about fast technique in this situation, if you can play more notes on one gesture, you'll be able to go faster. But if the flute is moving for every note or every two notes or every four notes or whatever, this is slowing you down. But if you're doing eight measures and the flute's just moving like this, it's amazing how fast you can play and how good it sounds. Okay, now we're gonna work forward flow. So I sometimes think about these two as like the compass on a map. You know, you have down and up, and then you want to have going across the north and south and east and west. Down and up is like north and south. You want the flute to be going straight up and down. Now with east and west, the flute goes straight. So you don't want any curly cues on the way. It's just a straight movement. And you're not moving the flute. You're just moving your body. You're going from your sits bone to your sits bone. So you're actually rocking. So we're going to go by fours just to practice this, this gesture. So four notes forward four notes back. Good. Now let's try eight notes forward, eight notes back. Now, if we could go to the next page. And now we're gonna go forward flow by, by 16s. That's a whole measure. And that could go on and do two measures, four measures, eight measures, whatever length it, it has. You know, one of Mar Joseph Mariano's favorite sayings was play on the air. And this is so wonderful because this direction that you're, that you're moving helps you always think about blowing out and playing on the air. And then his variation of that finger on the air, finger on the air. So you see the air stream coming out and you're fingering on it, which is, is, is kind of a weird sensation because the air is going this way, but your fingers are totally going this way. It's like a, it's, it's, it's kind of a cross um, idea. 
Okay. Now the next ideas are got kind of about what to do to to, to work on fast technique. And our first one is um, probably one of the most famous um, rhythms that high school bands do. Bum ba da 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 dum. Bim ba da 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 dum. But we're gonna slur it. Now the first note is a solitaire. We're gonna do down, and then we're gonna go forward, and then we're gonna just come back. And you won't need to do the down so much on um, on so on the it'll it'll work out. Just trust me. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Now, the next one is the same idea, but we change that rhythm into triplets. Anytime you can go from duples to triplets or from fours to threes, um, it puts the stress on, the, on certain notes in a different place in the scale. And that's when it really helps starts evening your fingers out where you feel like your, your fingers kind of have equal tension with them all. Uh, so we're not going to do number the number eight. We're going to move to number nine. And these numbers that are are written in front of these these are straight out of the scale book. And so there's I don't know 450 ways to play rhythms and and articulations and everything. And these are just numbered from the from that the back of the scale book. So let's look at number 63. This is one of my favorite ones. And if there's a day, uh, it's number nine, number 63. If I don't have a lot of time. Um, I will do this one because it really loosens up my fingers and I feel very relaxed when I finish playing. So it's down and then forward flow for the next um, eight notes and then back and then forward. So. <laughs> Great exercise. All right, now let's look at um, number 10 through 12. These three are based on um, DeBose's idea, and he has a longer version of this, but I just kind of cut to the chase on this, um, that often when you're playing a concerto, you're going along at a certain tempo and you have, you're playing notes by twos or by fours or something, and then all of a sudden you've got a whoom, big run that you have to play. And he said, it always takes you by shock. And so he said, let's just practice that. So we're going to do one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, seven, eight. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Okay, now let's go to the next one, four, eight, four. Back at the top. Good. Now let's do where to start with the eight right at the beginning. that at various speeds will really help you develop your technique. And I always try to make it when I'm giving a class to my student. The one where you have to do eight notes going over the top, I always make sure that we're on one of the high scales like B, B flat or A, because I want them to get where they can go over the top as easily as in the high octave as they can in the lower notes. Okay, the next ideas we're gonna use are based on um, on, on working articulation some way. Um, and and this, the very first one is a notation problem. 
because we see something written, but we don't play it that way. And what I'm talking about is the first eighth note and number 42, which is an eighth note. We never play da, 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 da. We always play ba, 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 ba. Ba, 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 because short notes lead into longer notes. They always phrase forward. And so that first eighth note becomes um, actually a 16th. And then we have a 16th rest. And that's called an articulatory silence. So da, ba, 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 The eighth notes always is about half value. Okay. If you want a double tongue this, great. If you want a single tongue, great. Uh, if you want to do it all with... Key, 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 great. If you want to do it with ha, 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 go for it. Lots of possibilities. Now on this line, let's go to number 43, the opposite of what we did. We're going to long, short, short. Now it's going to be short, short, long, short, short, long. Mm -hmm. Line two. Good. Now you could do it with tri with triplets afterwards. So we're going to line three. Dump triplet. Dump da da da. This will help Luis Blero. opposite of that where you put the triplet first and then if you look at the last one it's one four one four one this is the last line starting on the a good now something that you may not um may not have thought about, but um, when I was working on the chunking book um, and I realized what chunking was playing by inches because that's what the eye sees. The so eye sees a circular inch and takes in all that information in a quarter of a second and then it hops to the next chunk. So uh, when you're reading, you're doing ch hump, chunk, chunk, chunk. It's called, those are called, those little chunks, it's called a fixation. Um, what I couldn't figure out when I started doing this with my students is, is how good they all sounded. It was much later that I found out that muscles actually work on the off on kind of idea. So the whole idea of just tonguing something and tonguing forever, like a whole page of Anderson or something. And then my teacher used to say, you know, when you get to the bottom of the page, go back and do it. When you think you're gonna die, go back at the top and go and do it again. And that's where progress is made. Maybe not, you know, that actually playing fast tonguing and very small snippets, you're actually going to learn that gesture better in your brain and the results will be just much better. So you can give it a try and see what 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 you think. But for me, um, I always do tonguing things in a chunk. So like the Midsummer Night's Dream, I would chunk by measure. But that you play that measure as fast as you can and as clean as you can, you know, and then after you get where you can play all the measures, wonderful, then go back and play two measures chunk. And then go back three measures and, and then eventually you'll build it up. But you've practiced the right um, stroke for success. Okay, next um, we're going to talk a little bit about vibrato. Um, if you've never seen my x-ray video, if you Google Patricia George x-ray, it will come up. And I, I got in a fluoroscope machine, I think in about 2008. And it was part of a friend's doctoral thesis where he... Um, uh, was scoping everybody, all the woodwind instruments and writing about the different placement like of the tongue and just everything. And so um, I was his guinea pig for flute and he couldn't figure out how to quite how to do it because everybody else got in a fluoroscope machine straight on like this. But with the flute, um, because our spine is so strange, um, strong, you really couldn't get any definition in here. But he saw me doing, I like to do a lot of left hand flute um, things playing scales that way with just one hand and then stabilizing the flute with my right hand on the barrel. Um, when he saw me do that, he said, oh my gosh, I think you'll fit in the, in the fluoroscope machine that way with the flute, you know. So I was in this fluoroscope machine, which had about that much space, you know, and the, the end of the flute, everything from the G was hanging out. 
And um, the, what, probably the most interesting thing was when, we're, when I was doing vibrato exercises, and for me, it kind of proved that vibrato happens in the vocal folds or in, the, in what we call the throat or the vocal folds or the larynx, you know. And what happens is they're vibrating like this. And when they're farther apart, more air comes through and that gives you the sharp side of the, of the, of the vibrato cycle. And when they're closer together, that is the bottom part of this. So when you're playing and vibrating, you're your vocal folds are actually going like this. One of my students' mother was a speech therapist and she said, told me, she said, if you put it, because I'd always been teaching ah, 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 ah. And she said, if you'll put an H on that, it'll actually open that space a little bit more. So um, we start out with vibrato on them. Ha, 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 ha. Ha, ha, ha. And all vibrato is is slurring the ha. So you do. There's no movement in the chest, in the abdomen, in your big toe, any place. It all happens right here. And if you can um, become efficient at doing it right here, you're going to find your product is a lot better. Now, I know, you know, when I was growing up, he said, oh, we want, don't want to throw up vibrato or a nanny goat vibrato and everything. That has to do with placement. If you place the throat vibrato very forward, <laughs> you get the nanny goat. If it's ho, oh, 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 ho, oh, oh, ho, ho, face to place too far back it's made much too slow so it's kind of like an assigning scale between he and ha where you're going to be um and my kids think that's funny because they like comedy central and hee ha you know that i would use that in a lesson but you know if your vibrato sounds too fast then you're too much in the he position with the in the vocal folds and just see if you can move it back to more the ha if you're too slow and as i get older my vibrato is getting slower and slower and slower so i have to think about pushing my vibrato more to the he place but maybe you're one that needs to go to the ha so it's one of those things what you're doing so what we want to do here I like to just do some vibrato cycles. One, two, three, four, one, one. And I want you to notice that I'm making diminuendo. I'm coming away from one. That's something I really want my students to practice a lot because, um, you know, I, William Bennett was teaching my students one day and he went over to the piano and he played a note on the piano and he said, listen to that note. It goes boing and it decays. And he said, we flute players need to decay more. And he's exactly right because it's a lot more interesting to listen to if the notes have that more of that triangular shape so let's try ba ya 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 ba ya 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 da ya ya and listen carefully that the first note you play is not sharp I don't know with Zoom sound, I, I don't not sure you can hear it, but I was able to on most of those when I was I was tapering down. By the time I got to the end of the last one, I was able to get a whistle, and which I really like. I like doing that. Um, now, one of my favorite vibrato exercises I learned from Francis Blaisdell when I was a teenager, and it's this next one down. And you put five vibratos on all the ones of the first of the four beam notes. And then um, on the next notes, you don't put any vibrato. So it's one of those things of practicing the opposite to make something better. So we're gonna do da ya 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 ya, ba da 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 ya 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 ya. And this is to show you that when you land on a long note, the vibrato has got to start right away. You can't land and then start the vibrato. We hear that too much in flute playing, and it's not good. Um, so let's try. We'll try a measure of that. And of course, some of you who knew Frances, she always sang with this, I am going home to take a bath, 
to feed the bird, to wash the car. She had so many things that she was going to do when she got home, but she would sing this with you, with your scales. And I really think it helped us make our scales much more lyric where they sounded like music. It's really fun to do. And if I'm in a class, I may divide the room up in half, and one person plays the psalter at the beginning, one half, then another half of the room plays two, three, four, one, then the other one, and they sing song back and forth like you're playing ping pong. Um, another favorite thing to do is to take the vibrato off and on, just practice doing that. So, like, da, ya, 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 like that, and then opposite, da, ya, ya, da, ya, ya. And you could do that alternating anything. And once you're good at going from nothing to something, like zero to two, zero to three, zero to four, zero to five, zero to six, then you can start experimenting. One of my favorite things to do is one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, actually controlling how many vibrato I put on each note of a scale. It's wonderful for vibrato control. Let's just try that right now. Let's try first, we'll do the first measure, zero, two, zero, two. So the first note's none, the next one's two, and back and forth. And this is all a forward flow idea going forward. Do two one, we're in the second measure. And then you could do it with the threes, fours, whatever. Now let's try two on the first note, three on the second note, alternate twos and threes. This is the third measure. to do a lot of practicing like that where I really have control of what I'm doing the vibrato. I keep reminding, is your vibrato controlling you? Or are you controlling your vibrato? And the answer for too many of us is the vibrato is controlling us. Now, when you play, I spin. I think about having that vibrato spinning. You know, uh, there's the old story about the spinning orange um, that you have an, an orange in your mouth. And the idea of the orange is that means your, your teeth are really separated and everything's nice and open, your lips are there, and in there you have an orange, and your air has got, the, your vibrato has got to spin that orange. The orange may be a little big for you, maybe the, a little round red jack ball might be more the appropriate size, uh, but that idea that it's always alive and the, move, the air is moving along. Um, another thing with, with, um, with the scales, and this will be the last thing that we do, um, it has to do with putting ornaments on it. And I'm sure there's many of you who are teachers and you know how hard it is to get a student to play an ornament on the beat. You know, they all play before the beat. They probably play a lot of things before the beat, but uh, I just thought this would be a cool thing um, to do. And so I thought we could do it. Let's just, we're gonna put a more than, we're gonna slur by two. So we have a down, up, down up working the side figure, the Mannheim side figure, but we'll put a ornament, ornament on a mordant on the first note. Okay, this will be a down up idea. I just want to stop here and, and when the flute is at the down position that's the ictus like when a conductor conducts and you see that little jerk that's that's where you should be playing is on the ictus and I think this movement from down to helps you not play 
while you're still going down. You can't play the mordant until you're at the ictus. Let's do the second measure. Wait. 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 So you can say wait with them to help them figure out what that is. You know, what the, the old saying is that students play ahead of the beat. Old people like me like to play late on the beat. But to get a job, you've got to play on the beat. There's our problem right there. Okay. Um, now, the other thing I like to do is, is um, this last one that was written on the page is adding the mordant in there. And I like to do, I like to do a slow mordant because if you, once you start thinking about it or watching for it, you'd be surprised how many um, etudes begin with a mordant or, or with a grappetto or like the Schubert variation number five is a grappetto. Um, and we don't read it that way because we read by fours rather than by eights. Reading by eights is a, is a is, if you can get where you read sixteenths by eights, it's a real boon for you. So we're gonna do, da di da da, strong weak strong weak strong weak strong weak. Okay, and we'll do this in the key of F. <laughs> Then you can get fancier with it. Da di da 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 da. Morden da da da. Let's try that. So we put a morden on two and four and a graffetto on one and three. My favorite pages in the flute scale book is putting a grappetto on each note of a scale and I don't, I don't know if you've ever thought about that but the beauty of practicing grappettos is it's one finger up back again one finger down so you're you're going you're changing the direction very quickly and the flute is not going like that the idea of keeping that flute stationary so um Practicing grappettos is, uh, is wonderful for working on stabilizing the flute. So by my clock, my big trusty clock, <laughs> we're at, I guess, 1045 my time and 1145 your time. Do we have any questions that, that um, I'm happy to answer? You can just unmute yourself and go for. I don't know if, if it's legal or not. If it is, cut me off, Jeff. But I have a new book coming out that, that people say, what did you do during the pandemic? I wrote a new book. And actually, the book I started in 2013 and then just life intervened and I, I couldn't get it done. But with the, with the um, pandemic, I was able to get it finished. It's called the top octave for flute or piccolo, and it's 84 pages of way up high with ledger lines, uh, with cool instructions and things to do, a lot of great exercises and warm ups. Um, I, I just know my students need this because if you've, if you've never really thought about it this way, but the top octave notes are the last ones that you learned, you know, so all the other notes in the first two octaves, you played so many more times then you have those very top ones. And so we've got to change that around where we play the top ones as much as we played the bottom. And I have to say, I've been proofing the book and, you know, going slow because I don't want any wrong notes or anything, you know, and I'm getting better. 
And that's very exciting when you can hear improvement in your own playing, you know. So Denny Dorf tells me it'll be out early summer. So um, um, I'd love it if you'd give it a look. Any questions? Several What's people the did name ask of your book? About, oh, sorry, Deirdre. Oh, sorry, Jeff. What is the name of the book so that we can keep our eye out for it? The top octave for flute or piccolo. Cool. 84 pages. And, <laughs> and several people did ask for the handout. Again, it was posted at the top of the chat, but Kathy, thank you very much, posted the link to Pat's presenter page on the New York Flute Club website where you can download the handout there as well. Or you can write me georgeflute at hotmail.com. If you have any questions, I'm on Facebook. I'm happy that we went through a lot of concepts really quickly. Anything you want to talk about, I'm happy to talk with you or Zoom for a few minutes or whatever. So sure. thank you Judy, all for coming. And yeah. Judy Menden, Mendenhall has a question. OK. Hi, Pat. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for this. It's wonderful. You and I have had some good discussions about Michel de Bost, having both studied, both of us have studied with him. And I really appreciate your keeping his methods here alive. And, and telling us all about them. Well, I never officially studied with him. It was just the case where I would read his articles in Flute Talk and say, check mark, I could do that, check mark. And so out of the blue, I called him and I said, I have this really nice flute camp out here. There's about 65 flute players that come, you know, from all over the Intermountain region. Would you like to come out and, um, and teach? And he said, yes. And I said, so how much would that be for a week? And he said, $4,000 and a plane ticket and a hotel. And this was like in 1995 or something, which was a lot of money at the time. And I, I didn't have support from my university to do this. And I, I just thought, okay, that sounds good to me. And I thought, if nobody comes, I'm gonna have him to myself for a whole week and we'll just work on my playing. I had so many people that I actually cleared a huge profit on the class. In fact, I was kind of embarrassed. I thought maybe I should have sent him more money because he was marvelous and he loved it so much that he came out, I think five or six times over the next few years that I lived there. And he had a huge following, but he's such an amazing teacher. He's, he think he's thought about things so well. And if you don't know his book, The Simple Flute, you should get it. And then periodically you should reread all of his articles in Flute Talk. I've been trying to keep them alive on Facebook tip of the day because yeah. he, he's such a thinker and he, you know, he, he went to med school for a short period of time before he went to the Paris Conservatory. So he studied anatomy and he knows what things are going on. So he doesn't talk about things that don't work the way he talks about how things should work and everything and uh, marvelous, marvelous, beautiful player. And um, I wish I'd had him sometime as a, you know, as a, as a, as a teacher. Oddly enough, my daughter, who's an oboist, uh, was in a class of his at Oberlin, which he called Prima Vista. And it was for woodwind quintets. And they, all they did was sight read. And uh, he, you know, of course, parted with his words of wisdom when they were sight reading about how to phrase things and what to do and what pet, potholes to avoid and everything. So amazing person, you know, so. Cool. You were fortunate to have him. Very yeah. For, fortunate, yeah. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Barbara has a question. Just, uh, Pat, it's so nice to meet you in this way. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. I just wondered if you'd say a few words about um, what you got from uh, Francis Blaisdell um, oh, we have in common. Everything. I arrived at Interlochen having never had a flute teacher. I had a teach. I had a I studied with a guy who played clarinet who went to Oberlin and he was pretty pretty musical and then my next teacher was a viola player and then the next one was an oboe teacher who oboe player who had studied with tabato so that's good so he didn't have anything a clue to do with me so he taught me all the uh, tabato phrasing which was amazing you know but I got to Frances Blaisdell and the first thing after I played for her she said that's the most god-awful sound I've ever heard in my life <laughs> and then she 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 because I played with a ton of edge on the bottom I didn't know any better you know I was from Amarillo Texas I never heard anybody play you know other than on a recording and she said I'm forever thankful she said you have so many problems I want you to come every day at five o'clock and so for two months that summer she gave me a lesson an hour lesson every day at five o'clock and she did that for two years 
And my mother tried to pay her for all the extra time. And, and what she said was, no, I have a feeling she'll do this for somebody else one day, which is called the Francis Blaisdell curse. And so I feel like if somebody asks you a question, you've got to give them more than just whatever, because that's what she did for me. But she started, she just laid a whole foundation for me about how to play the flute. A lot of rare um, exercises and, and she talked a lot about him. She talked a lot about Kincaid. So my first lesson with Mariano, I was expecting since that she was the only flute teacher I'd ever had, that he would totally break down my playing again, you know. And I said, at the first lesson, I don't have any problems. He said, no, you're set up great because Frances Blaisdell did it. So, I mean, she really, not only with phrasing and vibrato and um, some repertoire, you know, but just basically how to play the flute, you know, about, about the whole way, how you angle the air or change the aperture or, you know, put getting the end of the flute forward. Amazing teacher, amazing teacher, patient teacher. I can't say that every day I was the most willing student, but I chalk that up to being like, I don't know, 15 or 16 years old, you know, so. <laughs> Lovely. Any final questions from anyone or comments or? Well, thank you again for this wonderful session. It's always a privilege to, uh, to learn from you. So thank you very much. And I, and I look forward to every day reading your tip of the day on Facebook too, so. <laughs> oh, good. yes. Join me on good. for the tip of the day, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> good. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. See you. Thank bye. Thank you. Thanks, Patricia. Bye bye, all. Thank you.